on on behalf of KFI Krishna Murthy Foundation, I'd like to thank all our guests today, particularly Ashna, who's actually center of this program with her book, and also Sayan, who will be in conversation with Ashna. So a warm welcome to all our guests today. I think, like you know, like so many of us, you know, I mean, I have also been somebody who was never very fond of mathematics. So recently, when we heard from Ashna that she was writing this book called Reimagining Mathematics, it's something that we found very intriguing, you know. And we wondered, I mean, whether that's really the case. But is it something that uh, people detest the subject? You know, people detest the subject. So is it something that uh, you know has a connect with life overall? You know, so we thought we could perhaps you know have a, a right. chatted with Ashna and asked her if she would be happy to do a program with us, and that's how it started. That's how the, the conversation about the program started, and then we got Sayan. Uh, Sayan, as some of you know, he's been on our programs, and he's been a, a very solid uh, anchor. In, in everything that he does, he brings a lot of uh, energy. He's a very good chess player, a very good musician, and now, of course, a very good facilitator of programs, conversations, etc., etc. So when Sayan said that you know he would be happy to do it, I mean we were delighted because that also is a, is an art, is a real art to actually get something out into the open, you know, through conversation. So that is how it all happened. So this this evening, I think the other thing that's very important is when we come to the interaction stage, maybe after 45 minutes or so, and when we are into the audience interaction uh, stage, I think it will be very good if uh, all of us, all of us who are participants and the audience, could you know sort of ask whatever questions you have, any comments you have, because it's such an interesting subject, something that has to really spread a little bit more. Because I've never thought of uh, mathematics. As anything other than very tough, very boring, anything that you know brings a different dimension is something that you know so refreshing. So please do uh, you know pull in with your questions and comments, etc. When we are at the interaction. So with those brief, uh, with such brief comments, try and take it on. Yes, uh, Kamalji, thank you for your generous introduction as always, and thank you KFI for thinking of such an exciting discussion especially in this day and age when the educational curriculum, the world across, needs a revisit, a relook, and a revolutionary shakeup. Um, as explained by Kamalji, we shall have a, this session in three segments, a brief introduction to Ashna this evening, and then a peek into her earlier years. And then we go straight into the book, Reimagining Mathematics. And the third segment will, of course, be the the interaction which we we'll have with our esteemed guests. And uh, so I think we'll begin with this because we are running slightly behind schedule. Ashna Sen was born and brought up in Calcutta. She double majored in physics and mathematics from Mount Holyoke College in USA, and thereafter obtained an MS in geophysics from Stanford University. She has a PhD in mathematics from the University of Manchester, UK, and completed her postdoctoral research from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. She has also studied and done her research at Princeton University, Brookhaven National Laboratory, and Oxford University. Ashna even taught mathematics to undergraduate students at Calcutta, St. Xavier's College, Calcutta, and at a mathematics village in Syringe, Turkey, which we shall discuss later. And she became interested in innovative mathematics education during her years at Brockwood Park, Hampshire, UK. Over the years, she has contributed to several journals and magazines, including the Journal of Krishnamurti Schools and the Tevinas Review, a historical memoir written by her on the lives and times of civil servants in Bengal during the pre-partition era of the British Raj, called The Rusted Trunk, was published by Writer's Workshop a decade ago, and it was later translated in Bengal. Welcome, Ashna, to this exciting evening when we shall reimagine mathematics and get to know little secrets of life and living through this extraordinary journey of yours. Hello, Ashna, and welcome again this evening. Before we even begin, I would like to start with those early years of yours. And you had this extraordinary uh, kind of upbringing where your father, your late father was an IAS and a senior bureaucrat, 
and also a mayor of Kolkata and a Krishna Bhakt. And he was also a Krishnamurti follower. And there you have your mother who is a liberal Muslim, an exceptional teacher of Urdu and Persian. And he was studying in a Christian school and living in a community <laughs> set up. So it's been a potpourri of, of, you know, cultures. And so would you like to start at the very beginning of, you know, how your upbringing was in those early years in Calcutta? Oh, thank you so much. I'm, uh, um, I don't know how I couldn't, uh, I mean, first of all, it's very humbling the way you, you put everything. It sounds like someone else. Then I realized, well, some of it was my life. Um, but uh, yes, going back to my early years, I think uh, it was a very interesting, uh, what should I say, confluence of uh, not different subjects, but I suppose different religions and cultures uh, quite by uh, by default and very much like Calcutta. So Calcutta itself, uh, you know, was a city that had Armenian street on the one hand mm -hmm. and there were Jews uh, who had uh, confectionery shops selling Christmas cake. Uh, you know, all the Bengalis used to go for midnight mass. Um, I myself uh, went to catechism class and nearly did first communion. Uh, because I was possibly a little confused about my background, mm -hmm. or possibly not. <laughs> but um, yes, uh, I think this uh, confluence was quite charming. And in a way, uh, you know, of uh, different religions and uh, different backgrounds, even of the communist era, just mm -hmm. um, and post the nutshell era as well. So um, very, you know, throbbing with uh, vital energy, I think, uh, both at the level of the spiritual, but also um, me growing up with a lot of Krishnamurti and uh, Krishnaji's influence, um, I think from the very outset, and uh, you know, I, I, it, it was wonderful. I mean, people might, at that time, of course, uh, everyone thought it was so confusing to a child you know, to have a Sufi influence, to have a Hindu influence, and of course, you know, linguistically as well. Um, but I think this influence is very important, just as a way uh, a person could be fed with all these influences uh, and, and, we, um, and attain a kind of balance. I think, uh, you know, part of the message of the book is that mathematics itself is fed by a whole lot of streams, you know, mm -hmm. um, art and math, you know, art and poetry and architecture. Uh, uh, literature, etc., things that you wouldn't expect to be linked to mathematics, including uh, religion and wor worship. And I say religion in inverted commas, possibly the way Krishnaji, uh, you know, talked about religare, I suppose. Uh, so, yes, so I think I'll stop there, but uh, it was a very interesting uh, confluence mix. So you had this remarkable experience of meeting K for the first time, I think was in 1980 when uh, your dad had got him across for a small group, uh, a discussion of few people. I mean, could you tell us a bit about that? I mean, was that your um, first? Was, yeah, that was my first uh, sort of meeting. Uh, all I remember is that my mother cooked gajar ka halwa mm -hmm. for Krishnaji and he enjoyed, uh, you know, eating it. Um, and of course, there were, you know, there was Mary Zimbalist and Radha Bernier and some of his associates at that time. Uh, so it was quite a remarkable uh, moment. And you missed a very important I, person was with you. You missed Supriya. Supriya and my was... doll, Supriya. Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, I, I wouldn't go anywhere without her. So it accompanied uh, me to the, you know, she accompanied me to the VIP lounge, uh, you know, at the Calcutta airport. And... Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I, I don't think I remember very much of this particular visit, but I do remember the Gajar Kahalwa incident because I could, I could see it. Um, yeah, so Krishnaji yeah. spoke to, I, I think that's what planted the seed for him to come back to Calcutta, Calcutta at some future date. Oh, so and, the plan uh, for 82 wasn't worked out then. So the 82 happened later as a discussion it when happened you came later down. yes but but the fact that you could even come to calcutta and yeah. i say that with uh, you know i i sort of am in love with the city but uh, the joke went that if you truly uh, love someone you won't invite them to calcutta 
So well said. That's right. And so the remarkable event happened in 1982, right? In 1982, I still remember it's 20th and 21st of November when uh, Krishna came down and spoke at the Hastings College, which incidentally, my mother was the principal of Hastings. So there's such strange coincidence, really. And uh, I, I still remember that evening because it was a Saturday and a Sunday. I remember going down on Sunday. So you were there too on Sunday, I believe, right? Yes. Both yes. the days. Yes, I was. And Definitely. how old? You were a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old yeah. at that stage? Yes, so something like that. And, and uh, you know, it was chock-a-block. There were about 5,000 people. I do right. remember that that was a sort of uh, audience, which was huge, of course, for, for that time uh, and to, to fit in there. Yeah. And that was a remarkable evening, really. The night was quiet. And even the trams running around Judges Court Road seemed to be traveling without any... Everything seemed quiet. And he started at dot six o'clock. I still remember the timing. And uh, he spoke for two hours, six to eight. And that was without a break in between. And I was getting so restless listening to all of that that evening. And, and there were just questions which came back to me after many years. So that was remarkable. Really. So um, could you tell us a bit more about... So, so your dad was then based in Calcutta. He was also the mayor of Calcutta at that stage. Yes, around that time. I mean, uh, you know, he wasn't the elected mayor, but uh, he was uh, nominated. He was, okay. of course, at that time in the IS. So mm -hmm. he was nominated because there was a vacuum, I suppose, in the position. But um, uh, the only technical thing I remember is that he had the powers of the mayor and the mayor in council at that time. And uh, yeah, and my mother's uh, relative uh, had a photograph um, a framed photograph in the mayor's office of A.K. Fazlul Haq uh, sort of reminded my father of that connection because he was also mayor of Calcutta at some point. I don't know the dates, but that's a little connection there, personal and, family. And the other part we missed out was your Saeed Abdul Malik, who was the district governor, district collector of Bhagalpur, was your maternal well, grandfather. That was a generation previously, yes. But, but that was important because of Rukhaya, um uh, That's right. Uh, you know, Sakhavat. Yes, yes, yes. She used to live in in uh, in in their house when you know um, her family. Uh, you know, after her husband had passed on, uh, there were some family problems, and mm -hmm. then she moved there together with I think a hundred people who were all residing in that um, merry house. And she first started, uh, you know, the women's movement, so to speak, the women's. Uh, you know, educating young girls, particularly minority girls, and there was no education before that. So that was the seed of the first kind of women's movement. And she was also a women's author, perhaps the first ah. author. Yeah, she wrote Sultana's Dream. That's right. That's right. So she started the Sakavat Memorial Girls School in 1911. That was after her husband's death. And she yes. ran the school herself for a great number of years also. Yes, yes, yes. She but that might have planted the seed in my grandmother's mind. And then she later, you know, created the, or founded, uh, uh, it, it was her sort of uh, idea, I suppose, uh, uh, this uh, college for uh, young girls, you know, it was called Parda College at first, and then later renamed Lady Brabon College. Um, and it shifted its premises to its current location uh, later on. So, yeah, this is all 1930s, end of 1930s, but this is all history and Probably yeah. we should stop here, <laughs> move on. Get yeah. that. So then you started after, so when did you move to the Eastern Himalayas? So this was after you got back from, uh, from Brockwood? Oh, this is from Brockwood. Yes, yes, yes. After the whole journey, this was more or less to take care of my parents. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this connects probably with um, sort of doing what, you know, doing what is the need of the hour, how life takes you in a funny meandering way. So, so you kind of the US and then to UK and then back to Slovenia and then you've traveled all over Europe. Then you came back to Eastern Himalayas. Then you were at the Kalimpong Center, right, of Center for Mountain Dynamics sometimes. That was very recently, yes, yes, yes. And now you're closer to Kolkata and Shantinagatun where you finished this book of yours. Yes. So that pandemic helped in many ways, I suppose, for you to finish the book. I at, at least, least that, yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so we are now going to, what we will do is, I'm going to take a two minute break and just show a couple of 
images, right, which will give a bit of glimpse about a uh, little bit of this earlier years we talked about. And then we can dive straight into the book. This is the one where uh, I'm going to stop here for a moment. So this is the first visit when he had come across 1980. Yes, yes, yes. Was 1980, right? She's Karuna Devi Karuna Maharaj Devi. Kumari, Karuna Devi of uh, Bhagwan. Yes. Incredible. And this with Mary Zendra. Amazing pictures, fellow. This is how my wife remembers your mother when she's teaching, Lady Brabon. And you're hanging around with Kay, how luxurious <laughs> is that? As a young child, I've got a couple of these pictures on. Must have been in your early teens then, or not even when you were 10 year old. Earlier than that, possibly. <laughs> This is the picture we need to talk about a bit. So this was with when mother had come across to meet your dad, right? At this was when he was the mayor of Calcutta. Yes, yes, Shaila. Ah, how extraordinary is this? <laughs> how old were you then? Uh, this was during my masters, so at uh, Stanford. Yeah, early twenties. And did you manage to interact with Stephen? Did, did, he, did, did you attend a lecture of his? Yes, yes, I did. I mean, us lowly students, uh, I just managed to slip in. So I was quite uh, uh, tickled by that and also very grateful. And I didn't find a seat, so I sat on a step right at the end of the auditorium. But that may, meant that he actually, it looked as though he was giving the talk to me because he came right in front. And uh, it was such uh, an honor. It was amazing to hear him. Amazing. Literally to actually be able to hear someone who is not able to, you know, move even barely, uh, just maybe one finger. Amazing. Something else, yeah. This was at the Brockwood Center. Yes, this is the Brockwood Center. There's uh, Colin uh, on the right, yeah. Yeah, no, you do tell us, and I can see Colin here too. Is is that Colin with with Brian? Or is, no, is that no, that's uh, Valentine, who be, who uh, I think might join us today. Really? He's already here. Yeah. And was this the first time you met Brian? Uh, yes, this was the first time I met Brian, but I nearly met Brian several times before that. Brilliant. And he was teaching mathematics also. Uh, no, he was teaching uh, religious studies, philosophy, Shakespeare, totally the humanities, yes. This was 10 years ago in, in Calcutta itself, right? When you released your yes. trusted yes, trunk. And we yeah. see Ari Vashudevan there. And that's the book we're going to get into now straight away. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I just thought we'll go through that briefly. I'm going to start with the words of praise, like you mentioned by Erickson. Yeah? And he mentions, Dr. Sen's wondrous treasure of a book will open many eyes and hearts to that which has been lost, the sacred majesty of numbers. And how mesmerizing and joyful learning can and should be this reimagined mathematics returns numbers to the forest and art to natural proportions, a fine organic medicine for a fractured world. And how appropriate is that? So would you like to just start off with that? With what made you write this book? How did this all come about? Um, this book, as I think many things in life, is uh, a sort of accident of... Um, 
quite by accident, it came about. Um, in fact, a friend uh, of mine uh, at Oroville, uh, literally she asked me to write this book after I gave a talk um, at her center. And, um, uh, but, but I've been the seed of this book was probably with me from the very beginning when I realized that, um, you know, the way mathematics, the way I learned mathematics certainly was very off-putting um, in some senses, you know. So it was although an, it, uh, in a way that, you know, uh, mathematics was just sort of choppily introduced, you know, in a linear manner. So you first go through your uh, numbers and then your tables and, uh, and then suddenly alphabets come into the picture um, and then that's called algebra and you have geometry and you have to learn all these theorems and lemmas and the same process. Um, and I thought this, this, uh, this, this cannot be, uh, you know, how mathematics is truly in, this, in a deep sense. But uh, I thought, you know, if I kept going on and on, I'd, I'd understand what mathematics really was. Uh, but during this journey, somewhere along in this journey, I had two uh, experiences that made me rethink mathematics for myself. Even. And uh, also in a way where I did not really um, have the answers. So I don't have the answer to what this rethinking mathematics uh, would totally entail. And, um, you know, and I'll come to that later. Uh, but uh, there were two incidents. One was I actually attended a class, uh, a creative writing class where the teacher said, um, why don't you write two essays on a very boring subject, like mathematics, but uh, for example, the refrigerator and uh, write one page where you uh, write, write it very technically and, and keep it boring and stayed, et cetera, et cetera. And the second essay should be the most riveting thing you've ever written. And then I realized, oh, so not only can I do this for an essay, perhaps one can do the same thing with mathematics and mathematics education. Can it actually come alive, not just on a page, but within you? So that quest was there. So that was incident number one. And the second time um, I sort of got a little uh, nudge was when I attended a talk um, that I don't, don't remember much about. The only thing, you know, in terms of its technical details, but I do remember attending this talk in London um, about the rings of uh, Saturn uh, and the spacing of the rings that were uh, detected by the Cassini mission, which was sent out. And okay. So all these um, uh, fancy uh, images were put on, on the screen and, and the speaker sort of just showed it and said, isn't this remarkable? And then I realized that I wasn't paying attention to the whole, uh, you know, to the message of what he was saying. And I, uh, you know, I, I sort of um, uh, became more attentive and I realized he was not only talking about the ratios, uh, he was talking about structure that came from the ratios of the rings of Saturn. So the rings of Saturn, they're not just the nine rings that we learn in school, you know, there's millions probably, you know, these bands of, of matter around Saturn forming these rings and there's spacing between them. But if you look at the ratios between the space from the center of Saturn to uh, say position one and the next position, you would think that they're just random spacings, right? But he was suggesting that, that they not only had structure, but they, they had musical structure, quite like the semitones of Indian classical music, or at least that's how I remember it. I mean, a true music of the spheres. And I said, oh my God, what is going on? Is, is a ratio linked not only, of course, to vibration and music, et cetera, as we know, but also to physical matter. That was quite mind blowing. And I said, I must uh, rethink how I, I look upon mathematics. So that was um, in the one sense, you know, rethinking at, at some level. But uh, the real rethinking, I think, came about much later. And I, I think as we go on to the, the other questions, uh, it, might, it might come alive. So, Aristotle once said that the mind is inclined by nature towards truth. It follows that we enjoy beholding things. We delight in simply seeing and hearing things in attending. Yet the simple attending gives rise to wanderings about the nature of things, in particular about the underlying order of everything. We have an intuition of the whole within which we experience all the variety of things that are part of this greater order. The mind is drawn to this greater order 
but from this arises all branches of knowledge that seek to understand this format in different ways. But more than this, the mind desires to affirm the truth of things. And so the arts and religions are spontaneously born as natural aspects to human life and society. To wonder and to praise truth with beauty is the most natural thing and where it prevails, civilization flowers. Justice and goodness are honored. And so human life and community flourishes. So from the natural inclination of the mind towards truth, human life flourishes. This is the natural process. To inquire simply out of this desire to know and to acknowledge leads intelligence to honor truth wherever it is found. This honoring of truth comes from wonder, puts us in this right relationship to things and to the world at large. It leads naturally to living virtuously. In a mysterious way, the order of things leads to perception of justice. This is easily observed in young children. And how brilliantly all of this is mentioned by Dr. Joseph Milne in his well-crafted forward to your book. So this gives so much of an insight into how you've got across this movement between chapters and the end. So we, I think this is a nice way for us to journey your book. And uh, would you just start off with explaining, you know, how this came about and the, and the process which you follow? Yes, I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Milne couldn't have put it uh, better. And I certainly wouldn't have been able to put the whole thing so succinctly. I mean, the, the meat of the book um, what it's trying to say, and even the things that it leaves dangling. Um, the, the whole point, again, you know, as we had broached earlier, is uh, that that understanding um, and, and even, uh, you know, mathematics is, is informed uh, via community. It doesn't appear in isolation. You know, it doesn't appear as a frozen thing that we have to learn um, and, and uh, you know, we have to learn and go through all the symbolism, et cetera, et cetera, as a whole journey. Uh, but but it is uh, it, it's really a whole of everything. So um, funnily enough, um, he puts he goes straight to it and says it comes from community. You know, community, communion, friendship, etc. Things that um, otherwise just seem completely irrelevant. You know, you look at a random mathematics chapter. And so say, does okay, mathematics well, does mathematics have a hidden language? So does mathematics have a, <laughs> have a hidden language? Let's see, I think it's a two-pronged question here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, if, if you ordinarily think of uh, the language of mathematics, it straight away goes to symbolism. Mm -hmm. uh, so even technically, you know, you have subjects like symbolic logic, you know, so uh, in, even in philosophy, so that's how ma mathematics is perceived. It's, it is, a, it, it's a developed, highly developed, language with all the symbols that uh, uh, the children first encounter, you know, the plus signs, minus, multiplication, division, etc., uh, greater than, less than. And then these are the kind of, alf it's a kind of, these are the letters of the alphabet, so to speak. And then you develop and further, further go, go along. Um, but I guess what I have uh, suggested as well in this book is that the language of mathematics um, can it step away from symbol? In other words, the world picture. So to some extent, it's almost what Krishnaji was talking about. I've, I've dared uh, move along those lines, you know, that can we be in a way free from the image or the world picture that is being thrust on us? You know, the grid of mathematics is the Descartian grid where everything is the same. Uh, you know, all of space is, is nicely gridded and therefore can be very cleverly and correctly measured. Uh, but, but can we actually have a mathematics that, um, uh, that, that suggests itself rather than, you know, it, it's sort of, it's almost suggesting itself through, and then we come to through nature. And that's also what Dr. Milne has mentioned, you know. So um, I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting a, a fresh curriculum where you, uh, you know, maybe I am, uh, or we are. This is this is everybody's endeavor. I think it's not me uh, 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 creating a curriculum here. But uh, can we um, uh, first look at everything around us naturally, uh, whether they are circles, whether whether it's the night sky, you know, the moon, etc., and learn about uh, number through that. 
and then even question what number is. So something that naturally emerges, maybe through just counting petals, you know, sacred geometry, um, uh, seeing how nature unravels, you know, and just sitting with it, just dangle with that question without feeling uncomfortable. Can that actually lead to a development of mathematics? That is the question. So you are some extent, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. No. So I was just saying, so you're suggesting sense. that an approach to learning mathematics, right, mainly through examples with nature and experience, would this uh, help to create a sense of wonderment and curiosity uh, for the young learner? I certainly have seen that every time I've, I've uh, delved into this new way of, uh, and I don't think it's a new way, everybody's tried uh, all sorts of things. And actually, if you look historically, that's where it came from, you know, so worship, for example, was very mathematical, you know, uh, 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 Ancient Indians were constructing altars very, very precisely. Uh, you know, tankhas and mandalas, etc., are uh, very mathematical and geometrical creations, etc. So, of course, from the very beginning, this form of mathematics has been also uh, developed, and, and you know, that's been the, the thinking. Um, however, um, I think here the, the question is a kind of stepping away from the image such that we're not obsessed necessarily with precision. That's right. You see what I mean? There's yeah. a Japanese saying, they actually value vagueness, which is very strange because that's the first thing, you know, I, when I first met uh, Brian, you know, he, he, these were one of some of the sentences he uttered. And I said, that's, that's very strange. Why would you value something that's so unprecise or something that's, bit, you know, uh, foggy? But uh, nature itself is foggy, you know? So, so here is this developed language, something that nature itself is suggesting. Yes, one plus one is two, but one raindrop plus one raindrop is one raindrop. It's not two raindrops. So you might say one liter of water plus one liter of water is two liters in mass. But uh, is nature actually suggesting that? Nature is actually just showing you that one raindrop and one raindrop is one raindrop. So can we really just appreciate and look at nature, just what it's showing you, and not nature apart from us, because we're not separated in a way. So, so really keeping the okay. separation hopefully to a min minimum mm -hmm. and, and hopefully not at all uh, from, from our environment, from nature, from everything. This is so interesting, but isn't this, is, is, isn't this somewhat uh, making it difficult for us to tear away from? Because that mathematicos, that Greek mathematicos says, which means that quality of things that are already given and yet must be remembered. You're just supposed to remember it because it's proven over Absolutely. time. And not just because it's proven over time, because you already know it, even as an infant. Mm -hmm. You see, that is much more important than what is proven over time as a theorem. Or yeah. at least that's 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 some of the teasing of this book. It's yeah. it's sort of suggesting that, but what it is suggesting, perhaps even I don't know so well. All of you would be able to tell me. <laughs> no, that's so beautifully said because that's even you have mentioned this that the acquisition of language comes from birth, right? And you've said that so well, and it involves the arrangements in the minds where a variety of sounds which are from the from the beginning it just assimilates, right? There's always a sense of language that predates birth. And that you've said so beautifully that and that I really love that <laughs> newborn child you've said and he's and he's, I think you mentioned that it's poised to create structure and assign meaning to words that form and and that encounters speech which forms later so that's a sublime way of explaining so would you like to just uh, say something on that I, I, I found that fascinating and you also said that is there also such a potential for picking up numeracy through merely being what a beautiful statement. Numerous, through merely being, through watching and observing faces, through noticing the arrangement of leaves, plants, flowers, through watching clouds, the night sky, the tapestry of things. And that is so incredibly, I mean, this taking it us away from the conventional way of looking at things. So uh, that was remarkable. Could you just uh, elaborate on that? I, I don't know whether I'm getting this. Oh, no, absolutely. Spot on, Chanda. In fact, you've said it. You've uh, said, uh, you know, that that this uh, natural um, suggestion, uh, you know, this, this tapestry that, uh, that we see around us, uh, that, that can there be something that's so effortless because of that? Why does, you know, I'm talking to you and you are all responding, etc. There's something quite natural and automatic going on. 
So we, of course, accept that. We even like that. And one of the reasons why mathematics, the way uh, it is, is uh, so unpopular is that it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel so natural. It doesn't feel like perhaps it does to or did to Shakuntala Devi bringing up another name. So, um, yeah. And given so, that lovely example of mother tongue, right? So when your natural instinct absolutely. happens. So could you like to, I, I love that example you gave when you said that, you know, when a child is born and uh, so automatically the mother tongue becomes so easy for you to identify and come up with and mathematics is treated as a foreign language or Greek or Spanish. And so yes, Greek or Spanish because it's also told, we're told that it's Greek and Spanish wow. and so something mm -hmm. out there you know you don't see a storm that's and it doesn't it doesn't feel mathematical to you but that's exactly what it is you know it's it's forming uh, flow patterns etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. so perhaps if we just watch that without any preconceived notion without even the emphasis or the hope that it's going to make us it turn us into uh, you know fluid mechanics experts etc later on but just purely just watching that you know so I think um, whether that or, or the sink if, or the tap, if, if you just open it mm -hmm. and you watch how water flows, that's so informative. And perhaps that, if it's done with full attention, again, speaking the words of Krishnaji, um, you know, uh, that may suggest a whole lot. You know, I used to open the tap and there would be this very thin trickle of water and I'd push, push that <clears throat> uh, push that back in a way, you know, almost pushing the water back, especially when it's a thin trickle. And then it would have these funny bubbles and it would start dancing. Until now, I think it's one of those open questions in mathematics. But uh, a child can easily just look at that and, and just sit with all these questions. Maybe okay. then, and this is a very big maybe, I don't have the answers. Yeah. That's all the point. That's also the point of this book, that uh, it's, it's everybody's quest and uh, I'm certainly no expert in, in any of these individual areas, but uh, it's more uh, a plea to, to open up and to all of us, you know. And I think as, as you've also mentioned very clearly that, I mean, not overtly, but there is an obvious flaw in the conventional system because there is no philosophical basis of numbers or what might be called the theology of arithmetic is seldom introduced to the child. I think you mentioned that specifically the theology of arithmetic. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Absolutely>. very, very. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, a, a child should be able to debate, all of us should be able to debate where number begins, you know. Is it so obvious that it's the number system that we've been uh, shown? Uh, is zero the first number, you know, because zero is very important and it certainly is a number. Mm -hmm. But is it the first number? What if we had no concept of it? Then one is the first number, but one is just unity. Uh, then two is the first number because, you know, you get a sense, sense of more. But that's just duality. If you just had zero, one and two, would you have any sense of number? Perhaps no. He so then, the first is <laughs> so why not debate this with children? There's mm -hmm. no clue. There's no, you know, uh, it's it's an open subject, perhaps. And so well said. And you've mentioned that children are fascinated with the quality of numbers more than the quantity, and that's yes, where we're wrong. That. Certainly, certainly, you know. So beautifully said. Okay, and uh, coming to quality of numbers and numbers, you need to share your experience with. With, uh, I think you were quite young when you met Shakuntala Devi. She was your neighbor, and did, did yes, you... that was a pure accident, uh, unless okay. you think, or unless that there are no accidents in life. But mm -hmm. uh, she was our neighbor because uh, you know she was married to my father's colleague uh, at that time, and uh, so just complete accident of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, I even knew that name very early on. Okay, and. Uh, um, Yes, and the one thing I did note or notice, because this was long ago in my early childhood, um, uh, the one thing I did notice is that there, it, there seems to be such an effortless free flow there. How can you look at something and 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 just see it all? And and um, even if you know some tricks, it doesn't make sense. That's right. um, and yet you can't just pass it on and say, oh, there are certain people who are savants or whatever. There must be something that is very intrinsic and that can be you know, absorbed in this manner, that's very natural. And perhaps it did, did feel yeah. very natural to her, certainly in this type of uh, number theory, you know. Because I remember uh, in those years, she gave up one of those BBC interviews. And I yeah. don't think at that stage, the computer could iterate beyond a certain point. So I think now you can do it to what I think, uh, what it's some, some trillions, like 60 trillion or whatever, till the decimal points. And she did it. 
uh, she mentioned it till about some she said specifically that it's only after the 31st digit that zero comes in right or something of that sort and she went on to rattle 31 digits <laughs> one after the other and and we were yeah. wondering what is happening so that's amazing and anyway so that's i was about to ask you whether you prepared for it and could tell us the first 10 digits but i'm going to let you go on that because i've learned yeah. it last night i sat and learned the first 10 digits of the pie to impress you and the audience and um, i'm not going to say that because i've forgotten it already <laughs> <laughs> That's what Max does to you. But I'll try. Okay. 3.141592653589. I don't think anybody knows what I'm saying. So it's okay. I know what I'm saying because I know what you're saying because I have it written down. You do. You're right. right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right? Okay. <laughs> can be. So researchers have said that the 62.8 tr trillion decimal points can be calculated till, right? So it, and it never. There is no ending to this, right? So that's why it's... Yeah, yeah. That's one of the questions in the book, that if a number never ends, can the next one begin? Right. What is the next one? Yeah. Amazing. So that's so philosophical in different ways, really. Yeah. Yes, I think at the core, it should be philosophical, even for children, because they are the biggest philosophers, the most natural ones, certainly. So Pi is omnipresent. So you have Pi used in art, architecture, poetry, and music, you've mentioned, right? In different spheres. So that's yes. that's an amazing story. So you've dealt with numbers. We'll come to that later, right? But I'm going to ask you this question. So does this emphasis on the sacred also seem to suggest God is the greater geometer of the universe? Oh, yes. Well, then I think we've skipped a little bit. So I'll come to ah. how we came to uh, the sacred. Yeah. I think there's a chapter yeah. called Mystical Numbers, right? That's right. And, Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mention uh, some numbers like um, uh, various constants that might be important in science, uh, or there are certain numbers that are very important in, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Jainism or Buddhism or mm -hmm. Islam, right. uh, you know, Sufism, etc., mm -hmm. um, Christianity, uh, and across the spectrum. So people have always. Um, found this or done this, you know, sort of isolated certain numbers that seem to have very extraordinary properties. Um, do we call it mystical or sacred? I mean, that's a big question mark. That's, I guess, another word. Like uh, 108, like 108, you mentioned. Yes, right? like 108, etc. And the extraordinary properties of 28. Um, I'll just give one example that actually hasn't even been mentioned in my, um, uh, in my book. And um, I mean, there's certain numbers just off the top of one's head, one can say, you know, I mean, say, take the number 37, 28 and all these other numbers have been mentioned, but 37 has remarkable properties and uh, symmetries. So um, if you have 111 divided by 1 plus 1 plus 1, uh, that's 37, but 37 is also 222 two, two divided by 2 plus 2 plus 2, and it's also 333 three, three, divided by three plus three plus three. And you can keep going. I don't want to bore people with specific okay. examples with numbers and things like that. But it's got these very peculiar properties and suddenly it stops at nine and there's a kind of symmetry breaking. Uh, mm -hmm. Why does this happen? So if children just sit and play, they'll actually find certain properties that seem very anomalous. And it might not just be because it's the number system base 10 and some other number system will have other peculiar properties and patterns, but there may be something quite intrinsically beautiful. Um, let's call it beauty, like quite compelling beauty in certain specific numbers. Oh, and they keep coming and they might be even relevant in your own life. So that's also something to sit with. And of course, Ramanujan was a yeah. master uh -huh. craftsman when it that's came right. to that. Mm -hmm. And I give an example of the taxi cab of uh, number. Uh, so if anybody's seen the film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, he does talk about a special number that wasn't very special at all to Hardy. He just, it's called a taxi cab number because he got off a taxi cab and he mentioned to Ramanujan, oh, this is just such a, an ordinary, very rather dull and boring number, mm -hmm. 1729. And uh, Pat came the response from Ramanujan that, no, this is not boring at all. In fact, it's uh, uh, the, the smallest number that can be expressed as two cubes in two separate ways. Um, so I won't go into the details of this, but that just meant that that number had some quite extraordinary properties that you could just le leech out, so to speak, you know, and um, 
I found that uh, quite fascinating and therefore I've left that chapter as a dangling question as well. So I, I was fast forwarding chapter five, six, and seven because they were purely with numbers and that got me a bit, you know, worried. Perfect, I, perfect. I, go ahead. <laughs> lovely thing at the end of that where you mentioned your mother had once told you, and this was so, so beautiful. Years ago, I think she, she made a comparison and she said that, you know, mathematics uh, is not so much more different and far removed from the world of Persian Sufi poetry. And she said at the highest level, mathematics and poetry become one. How beautiful is that statement? So <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing that, and that perhaps is what you've been taking through. I mean, this is your journey Absolutely. doing this. Absolutely. And yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful journey that everyone can join and you don't have to, one doesn't have to compare oneself. How able a mathematician am I? You know, it sort of doesn't matter. Let it just be a journey and let it just reveal to you what it does at any level and at every level. So in a way, you know, it belongs to you as a, you know, personally in the manner that it, you know, uh, suggests itself through maybe art and poetry or cooking. Very, it can be anything, you know, or dance even. And uh, that's... So, as a, so when you talk about mathematics and astronomy and poetry, we can't go by without talking of Omar Khayyam and he addressed oh, right. on this right and and attending to the problem of cubics by I don't know what intersecting conics and all that kind of mathematical stuff which he's done so uh, so Khayyam so what what does it happen is his left brain and right brain they're they're all it's 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 overlapping or is it it's not that it's happening with one after the other how does this whole process how does one a poet get into the rationale of looking and and trying to cut, get a conclusion, a QED to everything he does in life. I would rather be just expansive in my thought process and let it be and let it remain unsolved or let the mystery of it remain than coming to a conclusion to everything, a definitive end to a thought process with a full stop or with a QED. So <laughs> does it happen to you at times or do you just, just let the window stay open? and let the numbers fly out. I mean, when I was a practicing mathematician, which was a long time ago, um, then of course I had to, because I was quite uh, you know, young then, and, and to mm -hmm. get anywhere, you had to close the subject. That was the whole point. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I think the way we are talking about this reimagined mathematics, it can just be, it can be what, what you wish it to be, so to speak. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this is where poetry and rhythm and other things come in, I feel. Um, and certainly Omar Khayyam, it's not a coincidence that all these poets, whether it was Al-Tusi, whether it was Omar Khayyam, both in the, in the Sufi world, in the Persian world, but even, I mean, several others, and I'm not a historian or a, you know, an expert here, but Dante, for example, you know, and his uh, poetry, that was an inspiration for Galileo. And who would think that, that Galileo actually first encountered formal mathematics at the age of 19, You've almost, I mean, that's sort of when you when you end things, you don't begin and then become uh, the father of modern science and mathematics in, in some senses, perhaps that's, you know, and how. And that came straight from uh, a, a work of literature and that also an imagined work of literature. So uh, it must be linked. There must be so much poetry in mathematics and vice versa. And, and coming on, you briefly touched upon the music bit. So the ragas, also the Indian ragas are so structured and yet it's not structured. I mean, like Western music, you have its count, it's four, four bars and semitones and tones, but the Indian raga system has a structure. It has something which is definitive, but you break that structure and go and meander all over the place and you come back at some stage into the mainstream of what, that's that's why the Western musicians are so influenced by the Eastern musicians because we break free and then come back and yet the composite design of the music remains the same. So I think you talked about this also in your book. So beautiful. yes, but but Chanda, you're the right person. So it's almost like it should be over to you because you're a musician and mm -hmm. as a pianist, you would know uh, so much of that. Uh, you know, uh, so one comment is what you have been saying so beautifully said. I mean, I like that part where you even went on to mention about Vincent Van Gogh, and we'll talk about that separately. I mean, yeah. So that was unbelievable. That can you talk about that? Can we begin with a bit of that? With the, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, Vin, uh, Van Gogh's uh, uh, Starry Nights. I thought it was quite an. I mean, not just me. Such a famous work, but he has those twirls. You know. Uh, showing kind of the flow patterns, but that was, 
in a way very predictive of the solution of turbulence, which is yep. a standard problem in fluid dynamics, etc. It's still there's so much you know that's Mathematical unsolved. Magical turbulence, which you're calling, I think, call it. Yes, yes. It might even be one of those millennial problems, mm -hmm. um, you know, with with a one million prize or something for its solution. But uh, but but the artist sometimes just visualizes uh, in a way the solution, and not because he's seeking anything. Right. And that happened to M.C. Escher, and that certainly happened to, uh, you know, so this inspiration that you have from within, which is actually very mathematical in its nature and sometimes inspires standard pure mathematicians and, of course, applied mathematicians, physicists, all in this bracket. It's like That's a creative quite intuition, right? It's a creative intuition, which you have mentioned somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. This kind of peculiar creative intuition and where it comes from is, again, very mysterious and very beautiful. Oh, lovely. And, uh, yeah. I think what we're going to do is just quickly run through this beautiful little journey you have had at the end of all of this at the Turkish mathematical village, right? Where I think some part of uh, what you've explained in the book has is the direct experience of having it through students and having it in that environment and in that the whole curriculum itself. Would you like to talk a bit about that Turkish experience, the Turkish village experience? Oh, yes, uh, Shanda, that was quite a remarkable and very, uh, uh, how would I put it? It was sort of this eye-opening journey um, and also another quite by accident kind of thing. A friend, again at Brockwood, um, who was from Turkey, was talking about this uh, very new venture at that time, it had just started, of this uh, Ionian-style village that uh, you know that one could um, visit and where mathematicians from all over the world would come and gather and do mathematics purely for its sake for no degree for no diploma uh, with no incentive etc but just for itself just for its beauty i thought this this sounds so strange i mean what what, what is going on um, so that so I just wrote to uh, you know the head um, you know the person who was organizing this mathematic village and uh, and and we went there and uh, it was what what a dream it was it was this beautiful physical village built out of natural materials etc in the Ionian style in the style of Pythagoras it really looked like it was Pythagoras's uh, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Sort of group uh, of it's maths worshippers. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, maths worshippers in a way. <laughs> yeah. And uh, people were just sort of, uh, you know, learning and living together, cooking together, um, uh, you know, and, and this was this group endeavor. And it, it, it was so, um, in a way, so fruitful. It was like the best kind of mathematics that happens when community comes together, which I. Which, which therefore feels like that's where the, you know, where its place is truly. Because mathematics is thought of as a very isolated, very solitary experience. In fact, some of the, you know, uh, best mathematicians in the world uh, seem to be extremely isolationist in their nature. Grigory Perelman, for example, is a Russian mathematician who does not want to and does not wish to interact with anyone uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, follows a very solitary journey. So all that is well and good, but I think that the layers and layers of mathematics can be unraveled uh, when it's done together as community, because I feel it arises from community. And it's this experience... So it's community was, that's... Yes, yeah, sorry. No, so, sorry, it was so similar to when Jiddu Krishnamurti founded the Brockwood School in 69, right? Absolutely, and, absolutely, yeah. along the same lines. And I really mm -hmm. felt this was an embodiment of everything that was uh, that he was saying, you know, it was true inquiry, and perhaps no one used the word inquiry. It was a true delving into what intelligence might be, uh, without that kind of vocabulary coming out of the place. So, I was I was really surprised and charmed by the whole place, uh, and of course by the physical structure of it. And uh, most of it was created by uh, the students, you know. Yeah. So uh, lovely that was. I think. Yeah. Kamalji is giving me a very polite and discreet reminder saying that we are nearing seven o'clock. I think we are. So before I quickly end, I would like you to just give us a bit of, uh, you know, so the forward, the afterword written by Gerlina was exceptional again. It came up and said some things which were so meaningful to the whole composition of what the book was that the realm of the intangible should be cold and unfeeling and the realm of the sensible mere shadows of the cutting logic 
is a view wrongly attributed to many philosophical schools, starting from whatever Pythagoras and Plato. So yourself, I miss a learned and astute philosopher, Dr. Sen's mathematical sensitivities point in a much more fruitful and nourishing direction that the patterns of this world embodied in dance, surrounded in words of poet, woven by storytellers, painted by artists and discovered by genuine teachers along with the students are ways in which numbers too must become virtualized and how poignant and beautiful is those lines to sum up your book. So uh, I think, is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, are you happy with the outcome of what you wanted to get across in, you know, in those 188 pages? Yes, I mean, it's been a collective work, it seems, from even people putting in their own philosophy in the words of praise. So it's not praising Ashna Sen. I think it's it's actually, um, it's, it's taking from the book what, what they uh, have received. And it's very beautifully put. Of course, the, the foreword and the afterword are like perfect um, book ends. And I think Valentine has also I mean, put it so beautifully, wrapped up the whole thing uh, in such lovely words. There were two words, in fact, that he also uh, mentioned uh, that have not shown up in the book. And he said, it's, it's the re, re-mathematizing the imagination. That should be uh, that should be actually the journey ahead. Can you hear me? Or- Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you who haven't got the book, this is, the book is here. It's in 12 chapters. It's gripping. Even for a person who is a drab, boring, sterile, mundane, chartered accountant, I loved it and I've read it three times over. So each of you must get a copy of this book. Yeah? And it's available online too. So I think uh, Kamalji, since we are slightly behind schedule and I'm sorry for that, we just couldn't end so abruptly because I was just warming up with Ashna. But we'll have to take on the questions. And I think a lot of you all will have some questions to ask. So, Kamalji, I think I will, uh, we'll jointly address yeah, this. Yeah, sure, sure. If you want to yeah. ask any questions, you can just, you know, uh, put a hand onto your thing or you can just unmute yourself. And uh, Ashna will be willing to take on the answers. Uh, hi, Ashna. Uh, hi. So, th- uh, thanks uh, for a very enthralling experience being here and uh, also to Shayan. I think it was a wonderful conversation. Uh, You know, what immediately came to my mind when you mentioned mystical numbers uh, was uh, I'd read some time back about quantum entanglement. Uh, You know, uh, where uh, a particle at at anywhere in the universe can have an opposite spin. And then it led to the theory of soulmates. And mystical numbers also, the number one, 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 one is such a soulmate number. So, uh, you That's know, it, it just, I just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, quantum entanglement is baffling. I mean, I'm not a physicist, but I'll try to do my two cents worth of explanation. I guess uh, when two particles, I guess, are known to one another, uh, sort of meet even once, they get their properties get entangled in such a way that even if they're infinitely apart, uh, they recognize each other. So if you if you move one, the other also moves in the same exact manner. It's not just movement. This, this is, of course, properties of spin. But if you take it to the macro scale, it sort of meets. It means exactly what you said, soul mates or soul numbers. So uh, in a sense, you know, we're so connected, even as a community, which is why I keep bringing up community with mathematics. Why do you, ma- why do you join to uh, seemingly unrelated things? We must join it because... Um, uh, because, you know, we, there is this soulmate uh, mathematics, perhaps, that's also going on. I don't know if this sounded very clumsy or very strange, but, uh, uh, but there are, um, you know, there are connections or there are uh, ways in which um, numbers can be looked at, which, which go outside or go beyond uh, its precise meaning. So, uh, so there's a number, say you mentioned 1111 or uh, 111 or uh, 108, for example, uh, that has certain properties, of course, but that's the outer casing in a way. So what it truly means and how it manifests, et cetera, that's so much more. So whether it's a number or whether it's a piece or the building block of mathematics, even if you look at something piecemeal, like a specific number or a mystical number, as I call it, um, 
the the reason i mentioned the word mystical is that it's actually so much more than 108 or it's so much more than 28 it's so much more than and what it is perhaps is is quite mysterious and where it presents itself whether in your life you see it or or the number a soul number and also uh, you know numerologically speaking uh, right we have angel numbers so uh, you know, i read that angel numbers also help guide us uh, mm-hmm. in our purpose in life in in our in our life mission so uh, i don't know i just had these two thoughts you know what quantum entanglement and angel numbers after yes, <laughs> this was the coincidental <laughs> one this was the angel number that you know i just kind of i, I didn't think of it as an angel number but now that you mention it this seven pepper number and then the numbers But that is really an amazing number i think amit <laughs> is trying to get a solution so that he can beat me in the next game of chess no strategy <laughs> you will not be able to i think professor krishna wants to ask a question so can you just come on i'll go on thank you amit that was very kind of you yeah i found your book very fascinating uh very but nice you seem to suggest in the book that if one lets children grow up with nature they will somehow imbibe mathematics naturally <clears throat> and i think that uh, to me it seems a bit romantic notion because once you have learned mathematics you can discover its role in nature and wonder about it and discover the beauty of mathematics and the beauty of nature and so on and or in music or uh, harmony and everything but <clears throat> i think if you're just listening to music or um, spending time in nature you won't automatically come to mathematics but your book uh, seems to suggest uh, that as as I, a I, I, way yes, of I, doing I, mathematics in education That's well i question. think it, it appears i totally understand why it feels like it's this romantic uh, approach the approach may be romantic but all i'm actually suggesting is that certainly the initial years say if you take the case of finland for example they actually implement this they don't teach uh, children formal learning till much later and certainly even in the ordinary league tables etc they they have noticed they actually top the world league tables in terms of uh, you know performance at the 12th grade or whatever so it actually i think the benefit is of just leaving children uh to form their own relationship and that relationship to foster and suggest itself in the early years such that later on even if you learned mathematics as a formal uh you know classroom style introduction there would be so many connections already formed the child will already know so many things you know it will already understand um uh for example the digits in one's hand a lot of physiology uh you know projectile motion and things like that it will seem much more natural than just suddenly getting it thrust upon you you know if you play ball sports for example uh the fact that uh, uh, uh you know a projectile has a certain shape doesn't come as a huge shock because you've experienced it and you've seen it in its natural setting so the same type of thing happens i i feel with nature and i i think the main problem is not that you won't come upon mathematics or you will uh, naturally uh, without the classroom learning but the main problem is that we are so divorced from it from the very beginning we don't even get a chance so if one is on the 27th floor and all you have as a 4 year old or 5 year old is an introduction to the class classroom style mm-hmm. mathematics and physics my big question here is that whatever comes at the end of that horizon you know you might in fact say that that is what has come that is what the world has suggested that is what galileo has kick started in a sense you know galileo and newton and prior to that so many other mathematicians etc um uh, that that it has led to this path but actually we don't know what could have been to some extent and here i i bring up japan uh, sir because there was a period called the edo period when uh, japan was cut off completely from uh, from uh, you know western influences so the temple mathematics was created during that time 
where actually they think of geometry in a completely different way. It may end up in calculus, right? So I'm not, I'm not denying that. But I'm just saying the whole structure, the way they actually think of a mathematical or a geometrical problem, um, even now to some extent, is very different from how we've learned it in the standard sense. So that's why my question is also provoking that. So the whole book is actually a whole lot of dangling questions and suggesting that can we be comfortable with that, to just sit with it? And uh, that was more the trust so, than, than to say that we naturally you know, come upon it. I agree with that, that one would need to do a to and fro between the learning of mathematics and the contact with nature. And that would make the mathematics much more real uh, and not abstract. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Very nice to see you. I think, I, think, I, think, uh, I, think I think Sonnet follows the mathematical formula. And second is about the binary number and its application in telecommunication. And third is that Fabonica series. So you are going into mathematics today, oh. Fabonica series. <laughs> because oh, statistics right. has been my oh, subject. Oh, so you've got the book. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. No, I, before she answers your first part, I'm going I to, want to answer. Sorry? No, I just thought I will say, you know, uh, uh, we forgot to tell this earlier. You know, the, the, the National Academy of Sciences had documented 114 different song types from 14 male hermit thrushes. And they came to, they, they were isolating the frequencies and they corresponded to each notes and they calculated the mathematical relationship between the pitches, which were, and they, and they came to a, a discovery which was very similar to what the birds were actually you know, singing in their harmonic series. So there was a mathematical explanation. Correct me if I am on the right track. Yes, absolutely right. Yes. So that's such an interesting kind of thing. So you're having science to even try to explain what is happening in its natural form. So this is the reverse kind of a thing happening, really. Exactly. And in a way, this is uh, also responding to what Professor Krishna was saying, mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, you know, if, if the children are exposed to, uh, you know, song and the beauty of nature, they won't automatically, you know, derive all these uh, things. Um, and, and although, you know, of course I agree with him, but I'm saying uh, that, that, the, that the bird is not concerned with anything really. It's actually concerned with just singing. Right. And, and, you know, so it is a kind of worship, you know, for the sake of worship. It's a way, it's, it's um, in the words of a philosopher, I suppose it would be, um, uh, 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 it, it would be trying to know and get, and get known. So you're trying to be known and you're also trying to know. So in a very simple philosophical manner, that's all it's trying to do. So oh, you can exactly. also argue it's not trying to do anything. It's just singing. So can we just do that? Can we sit with that? And can the child is also interacting with, and this is not just early pedagogy. I think if we also had that attitude instead of um, you know unpacking things, okay. because, because that's endless. Of course, you can go to the paper. You can, um, you know, you can consider consult all the, the thick textbooks, et cetera, and, and, you know, get to the crux of it, whether it's a calculus problem or whatever, but that peculiar intuition that comes and sometimes even comes to some of the greatest scientists, you know, in their moment, whether it's Tesla or whether it's Einstein, et cetera, it, it sort of comes from elsewhere. It comes from more of an engagement with everything altogether in its totality. And that's what, I, well what I'm suggesting. Absolutely. Now can answer Gotham's question of numbers. I mean, Fibonacci numbers are something which I will not go close to. <laughs> yeah, he'll be able to. He's the statistician. He'll be able to. Series in nature, right? One point six one eight zero, and it goes on and on after that. Right? Yes, these days they're using it for everything. For um, you know, the stock market and, and predictions in the stock market. Whoever does that, they're using Fibonacci. Virtuous man. The was it used by for the for the I mean I don't know was that uh, the you know the circle which went round exactly. yeah very interesting uh, picture here mm -hmm. because uh, it it's uh, it's right. more than one picture in one so when there's movement it's almost but like an iteration circle is never the same right the center of the square yes it's a kind of a squaring of the circle 
but only when you do several iterations. So where is the center? The center goes where? Really? It's, is it near the navel? Is it? Yeah, but um, I feel the center is the eye. Okay. <laughs> you asked me the center. What is the? You know, let's let's try to wrap up this question. Earlier you had asked uh, your last time when we had spoken. Yeah. That uh, where is the the center of of uh, of the man? Movie. I suppose. Yeah. 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 So uh, maybe at the physical level, it's it's possibly where he points out, but uh, perhaps it's. At the poetical level, it's the eye, right? If you can see, that is the center. And uh, to wrap up with Krishna Ji, that's all he's asking us to do. You know, so who is the observer? What is he doing? He's actually witnessing and he's observing. And uh, I suppose that is the center. You, know, you can call it the third eye or what Krishna Ji suggests. That's right. Um, Sir, so you can ask a question. Who I... Are you asking me or is yes, somebody yes, else? Yes, yes. hi. Sorry. You're on okay. Screen. Well, first, let me say hello. Firstly, your hi. book sounds absolutely... Hi. <laughs> your book sounds absolutely fascinating. Even as I was listening, I was trying to buy it online. Uh, uh, but you rejected my card. So I could speed well read it. And I feel, I feel a bit frustrated because I don't know the content. I had to guess <laughs> what the content was from what was being said about it. And so I don't know whether to, how much to comment about it, but from the ensuing discussion, I get a kind of feeling that the prevalent understanding, certainly in this group and this discussion is that mathematics is about numbers, right? I knew you were going to so, say that. <laughs> sorry. You knew I was going to say that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we know each other and we know each yes. other's mathematics well. Right. We taught mathematics yes. together in Brockwood for a long time. So, so uh, do you in your book mention, say, when Einstein writes the equation of the universe, which produces the idea, which is actually very simple, not mathematics, uh, doesn't even take half a line. And that predicts, from that you can figure out the calculation, the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe. Black hole. And everything. Mm. Black holes, the works. And all that condensed into a very simple looking equation. So that you mentioned that kind of connection, that kind of role of mathematics? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't, actually, I... I mention numbers as patterns in only one of the chapters. But there's a lot yeah. of uh, talk about fluid flow, for example. So there's talk about storms. Yes. So when you see storms, yeah. why are storms or why are earthquakes quite unpredictable? So these days, yeah. uh, you know, when people study the larger thing, and, and certainly mm -hmm. I don't mention Einstein's equation specifically, but I do uh, talk about other forms of mathematics, non-number uh, forms of mathematics, mm -hmm. non-pattern okay. forms of mathematics. But I do talk about flows a lot, and I do um, yeah. talk about uh, even towards the end. You know, this. Uh, uh, I think there was a storm called uh, Amphan and Yas that just yeah. you know twirled around physically in such a magnificent manner. I witnessed one of them, um, and then I actually uh, told my children that. Um, you know, this is very unpredictable, whatever is happening, just, just watch it. So we watched it together in wonder as these dark clouds kind of, you know, circled the skies. And uh, is, uh, can you hear me? The screen is yes. yes. really frozen. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the mathematics of uh, fluid flow, it, call it that, or yes. streamline, etc., yes. and this purely yeah. turbulent behavior, uh, why is yeah. it so difficult to capture? So most people these days, they do a huge amount of data mining. So it's just you you pummel it with so yeah. much data and you add it, of True. course, with equations and that's how you predict it. But you can't predict it very well. Yeah. You try to then model it with the butterfly effect. That doesn't work either. So these types yeah. of models of, of mathematics or witnessing the world pi picture and delving yeah. with it or dealing with it, yeah. that has uh, a lot of beauty. In, and that's the kind of beauty you're suggesting. So in two lines, you might have just two words, but it actually, um, it encases in a way 
generations of mathematics. I mean, people sitting with this and, and um, right. you know, page yes. after page after page or something that Andrew Weil yeah. would do uh, in, in yeah. solving Fermat's last theorem, um, you know, yes. or something that uh, some of the more recent mathematicians, uh, in fact, I, I wouldn't know very much about it, but certainly people delving with instantons, etc., uh, including Maria Mirza Khani uh, was a recent mathematician. She passed away, unfortunately, but she was the only female fields medalist, I think. Um, yeah. And the type of mathematics she did, uh, the reason it was so beautiful, it was combining things that were uh, from different fields into one and then presenting it in a very beautiful way. That's why frequently mathematicians and physicists use the word beautiful. They're ecstatic as though they're doing poetry. And, and it is because you can absolutely. In so I'm going to interrupt to here. Yeah. I'm sorry, because when she's brought this up, I, I just couldn't resist, Harsha. I'm sorry, I'm coming in between. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead complex yeah. topic of number and geometry in the natural form. She starts off with this beautiful quote. The body is a device to calculate the astronomy of the spirit. Look through the astrolobe and become oceanic. And how lovely is it to start a chapter which is so complex <laughs> with a quote from Ruby. Yes. Yes. Unbelievable, really. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say that that's what attracted me to mathematics was beauty. The beauty of it. I always saw from the word go the beauty of mathematics. And uh, as a teacher, I always try to convey it. But going along with what Ashna is saying, uh, would you say that there is a pattern, an order, which you're talking about uh, flow, you're talking about uh, and music, you're talking about even people's behavior, the stock market or whatever, that there is a pattern and order in, in nature, in everyday life, in even in human interactions. And wherever there is pattern and order, that there is a mathematics. And in that sense, mathematics is like music. In that there's music. We all know that we have no difficulty there. We know what music is. Yeah. And then when we see the notes written out, or we see a musical score, we don't confuse the score That's with so the music. Well. Absolutely. Yeah. How well said. But, so the, but for mathematics, and this is, I think, where it goes wrong, the teaching of mathematics goes wrong. This is never made clear. It is as if the mathematics was what was written down. Yeah. But it is, it's the, and that is ex natural mathematics, let's call it that, is accessible to everybody. This pattern, this order of the universe uh, uh, is uh, there. That and out, can I just uh, add something to what you just said? Uh, yeah. especially in chaotic and chaotic systems, like when we are talking about chaos theory and complexity theory, yes, yes. I had read that uh, when the system is stable and unstable at the same time, there yet yeah. exists a pattern, there yet exists an order where we can look for strange attractors. And, uh, yes. uh, you know, so I was just wondering if such a thing exists, uh, especially for a, for a stock market, what could be a strange attractor? Uh, you know, uh, so... Well, I, I, I do know chaos theory and I do know about straight detractors, but I don't know so much about the stock market. Actually, I do because I also try and study the use of intuition, which is the strongest. <laughs> and you, no matter what iteration. Which you're very right about that because at a, some point, the mathematician uses their intuition to solve the problem. Absolutely. The C's, people say, talk about it like that. They say, you see the mathematics. Absolutely. Then writing out the logic or writing out the solution or writing out to actually verify that, that's a, that's a later stage. Just like you hear the music. That's right. And you I see the mathematics. Even at every level, even for a highly skilled neurosurgeon who's performing a very complex op operation at some stage it is unknown he's just using his instincts to come to you know some outcome which he feels is best i mean no matter all the years of experience and what he's learned on the ot it doesn't work it just works with some wonder which happens spontaneously with his innate being i suppose 
I think that's what you're referring to. But I, I think in a very simple way, Ashna has also uh, mentioned this, I think somewhere that the golden ratio is trying to explain some patterns which is happening, which you've yes. mentioned so beautifully in the Sufi dance or whether the yogic asanas or the postures yes. by the yogis. So that itself has some kind of a, a an, am I right with that kind of a basic yes. understanding which you mentioned, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And the chakras in the human body, does that also have some kind of an alignment which comes within this whole scheme which you're talking about? Because we talk mm -hmm. about it in two th other ways. I mean, the chakras is something which is established and yet some people question it, saying that energy flows do not happen just through the chakras and it happens otherwise. Um, have you mentioned that in your book? I think you have mentioned somewhere there. I'm not too sure. I don't remember that clearly. Yes, I mean, I've just mentioned it in the a kind of almost like a historical development of certain numbers and, and uh, the significance of, of them in, uh, uh, in, in various sort of yogic, uh, I suppose, uh, what should I say, uh, presences, you know, like, like chakras uh, you mentioned. And what about the vastus? The vastus? Yes. Does it does it have yes. any radical significance? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's a whole uh, subject. In fact, uh, one of the panel members, Meeta, she mm -hmm. uh, uh, she has this Oroville language lab. Uh, she's the director there in Oroville, and uh, the entire structure is very uh, mathematical and and as they say, vastu compatible, etc. But when I first entered the Oroville language lab building, uh, to me all kinds of mathematical order was sort of popping out. And uh, because of that, I felt the whole building was in a way singing and very harmonious. And I even mentioned it to her. And she found that um, both charming, but very odd as well, because I was uh, witnessing the proportions. And she said, that's not how, of course, we designed or created it. Of course, it's, it's got the vastu element, but we were just going for beauty, you know? So, so the light comes in in a natural manner. But actually what it's doing is it's aligning itself very closely to the mathematical proportions, et cetera, that Harsh is talking about. And therefore there's pattern in chaos and in, in order in all of that. Um, also what, what he mentioned just now and the big book kind of more than hints at. Then I have one question for Ashna. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ashna, you know, I mean, just out of curiosity, you know, when, uh, when we hear Krishna Ji, you know, talk, talking about teaching history, you know, and you can always, you know, I mean, when he used to say that you, when you teach history, uh, yes. you should be telling the child to think about the human behavior that caused what happened. You know? And you can actually relate with that. Now, you know, comparing that with, say, the subject of mathematics, you know, mm -hmm. how does one approach that? You know, that because there for, a, for, a, for anybody who's looking at history, you know, you're looking at events that happened. So you're looking at the past. And then you're figuring out human behavior and all that. How does that you know, apply is something like mathematics? Just curiosity. Yes, I mean, there's a, even a subject called uh, history, of, uh, history of science or history of mathematics or philosophy of science and mathematics. Um, but I think if that was approached and taught in a very, very interesting manner, it actually unravels the step-by-step -step, uh, step history of how mathematics is taught in the first place. So you'll be able to recognize how the, you know, the class three or class four student is first studying something that, that are the building blocks that have been suggested way past in the past uh, as quite advanced subjects, perhaps. It was quite advanced at that time. And then historically it unraveled, say for example, in the Indus Valley civilization, they certainly knew about circles and they certainly knew about um, certain types of proportions, certain numbers, etc. And that's history. So you're actually interested in the history, in the unraveling of that history, but actually what you're doing is you're studying geometry and you're studying, you know, all of these things. So when you see these symbols, et cetera, which apparently is being unpacked now these days, uh, their hieroglyphics, et cetera, et cetera, and their script, which was uh, till now quite, you know, a mystery. Um, it is encasing both the history and the history of mathematics. And of course, further along the line, you have all kinds of problems um, that are unpacked, like Tartaglia, for example, or Tartaglia, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the Italian mathematician who uh, discovered uh, or invented cubics, the solution to cubics. So that came much further along. So you have certain markers of time, historical markers of how mathematics as we know it developed. 
So that's certainly you, you just if you study history, you're studying mathematics to oh. some extent. So that's how I would put it. Kamal, the ball is in your court now. Yes, I think I think if we've lost Gautam altogether, so we will perhaps have to wait for his question, perhaps by email or something. You know, Gautam yes. Baba. <laughs> but because it's nearing 7:30, and we had thought that we'd end by 7:30. Uh, and I think I'm so happy that this program had a momentum. It never felt as though it was actually, I mean, I just, one and a half hours have just flown. But thanks to everybody for you know, joining us today. And as Ashna said, I think one of the big things, you know, if, uh, if this book can achieve is actually a, not just a re-examination of mathematics, re-imagining of mathematics, but a real look at the whole education system, because I think her book suggests that it's not just mathematics that needs a relook; it's education as a whole. So I don't know if somehow if this dialogue can continue beyond this program. So please do keep in touch with us. Your feedback, your suggestions. Some of you actually have come, uh, you know, directly from. Uh, so please do get in touch with us on email. We're delighted to hear from you, and in fact, suggestions as well for for future programs. And We'd like to see Yuga there from Japan. He's there as well. You go. So thank you, Ashna. Thank you so much, Ashna. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you so much, Ed, for being such a wonderful facilitator. Lovely. Thank you, thank thank you so you. much. Deeply honored. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, bye, everyone. I think bye. we just sign off here. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. bye.